My readings this morning come from Mark's Gospel and then from the New Testament letter to the Hebrews. I might mention before I read that um, our singing, How Great Thou Art, at the beginning of the service and Jennifer closing the prayer time with How Great Thou Art, takes me back, it ushers me back in time to 1965 at the summer after my sophomore year in high school. I was in uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin in Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And we sang that song every morning and every night because that was the theme song of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So I knew that song by heart when I was in high school. I can sing, I think, all five or six verses. Uh, but the, the, one of the reasons I mention that is last week's sermon was on mentoring. And four men who mentored me when I was in high school accompanied us to uh, FCA camp for three summers. And one of them was a, child, was a product, Jim McCormick, who was long involved in this congregation. Jim was one who went with me and who led the, the young men. Another was Fred Spencer, another was Tom Barrett, another was Walt Madden. So those four men from Vincennes uh, were significant mentors to me in those summers of my youth. And so that uh, carries over from last week's sermon and, and gives homage to honor to men who were significant in my life many summers ago. Our reading today from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, you, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became, began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The last two verses of chapter 11 of the letter to the Hebrews. Yet all those, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. God bless as always the reading from the Holy Bible. Let us pray. Loving God, we're so glad to be back together in worship. We're reminded that the pandemic that's caused us to be dispersed has not gone away. We're reminded that you continue to Ask us to take care of ourselves, to be safe so as to not to transmit disease to others. Still, notwithstanding that, we're happy to be here together in fellowship. Even if we can't shake hands and hug, we are here together to worship you. We thank you for this time. Amen. Well, actually, it really is good to look out and see somebody. I had to retire before I became a televangelist. 
Somebody told me coming in, it's been this, this is the 14th week. We, we, for, March 15th was, a, was a, the first Sunday that we were, uh, I think John preached that Sunday. It was the first Sunday we were online. So we had 13 weeks. So one-fourth of the year, this is the 14th Sunday. So it's good to be back. It's good to see you back. And I so deeply uh, am indebted to the Dellingers and to Rex and Jennifer and those who helped us carry on worshiping online. When I was in seminary, my preaching professor, my preaching pro- professor required us to submit a sermon in a sentence before he would accept the fully written manuscript. When we submitted the manuscript, then he would compare He would compare the manuscript to the one-sentence synopsis we had given of the sermon. And if the manuscript did not contain the central idea, was not built around the central idea that was in that one sentence, he gave us the manuscript back and said, rework this. Because the manuscript has to conform to the one-sentence synopsis that you've given me that is the central idea of the sermon. So we couldn't preach the sermon until the manuscript and the sermon in a sentence were in congruence. So if there's one sentence that embodies the central idea of the sermon, the manuscript had to conform with that. Or we couldn't preach the sermon and get a grade. So first we had to give the sermon in a sentence. Then we had to give the manuscript. The manuscript had to be congruent with that sermon in a sentence. Then we could preach it and then we could get a grade. Well, brevity has its place to be sure. One of the greatest speeches ever delivered on North American soil. The Gettysburg Address was two and a half minutes. Well, here's the deal. I'm not going to say everything I'm going to say today in one sentence. I'm not even going to say it in two and a half minutes. But I will stay on point so that this afternoon when you go home and somebody says, what was the sermon about today? You won't have to say, I don't know, he never said. (laughs) Yeah. My sermon in a sentence today is we can change the world if we put service above self. If we put service to others above self, we can change the world. Well, some of you might right away think to yourselves, that's a grandiose idea. We are not world changers. You may think to yourself, I'm not a world changer. The president of the United States may be because things that he does can influence global prosperity or influence world peace. So the president of the United States might be a world changer. A physician who develops the protocol to transplant human hearts, that person might be a world changer. A scientist who allows us the capacity to travel in space and walk on another planet, that person might be a world changer. An artist who paints a masterpiece or composes a symphony that continues to lift the human spirit centuries after that artist is dead, that person might be a world changer, you might think to yourself. But I'm going to continue to insist that ordinary people like you and me change the world every day when we put others, service to others, above ourselves. 
Our Lord obviously had much to say about serving others. Today I read from chapter 10. Today I read from chapter, chapter 10 of Mark's gospel. One chapter back in chapter 9, Jesus said, I'm going to die. Three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. He's walking along, talking to his disciples. And what do they do? They start arguing among themselves, who among us is the greatest? And Jesus knows what they're talking about, the script chapter 9 says. So he says to them, the one among you who would be first must be last. The one among you who would be great must be the servant of all. Well, they didn't hear him because now we're in chapter 10. I started with verse 35, but in verse 32, he tells them again, I'm going to be put to death. As if they hadn't heard him a chapter earlier. Three days later, I'm going to arise from the dead. And what do they do this time? James and John say, hey, Lord, when you come into your glory, would you do us a favor? Would you put one of us at your right hand and one at your left? Again, they're not worried about Jesus dying. In the last chapter, they said, who among us is the greatest? This chapter, they're saying, hey, two of them step forward and say, hey, do us a favor. The other ten are very upset, we learn about that. The other ten are angered when they hear that. And what, do, what is Jesus' response to them? Jesus' response is this. You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not to be so among you. Whoever wishes to be great, become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must become the slave. Not just the servant. The slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus says the whole purpose of us living is to put others before ourselves. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Again, I insist that when you and I put others before ourselves, we change the world. People who put others before themselves seem to me to have some common characteristics. They tend to have authenticity and the cousin of authenticity, integrity. They tend to have humility and the cousin to humility, which is gratitude. And they tend to have imagination. Authenticity is the first of these attributes alphabetically, so let's start with authenticity. When I decided to change careers and to go into Christian ministry, my mentor and my pastor said to me, George, just be authentic. Be yourself, because people will not follow someone who's playing a role. Peter Berger was one of the great seminal minds in the 20th century 
in the sociology of religion. He just died a couple of years ago at the age of 90. But his writings influenced generations of people who studied for Christian ministry, including me. And among other things, Berger wrote this. He wrote this in the second decade of the 21st century. If anything characterizes our time, it is the loss of a sense of transcendence. We long, we long for someone with a soaring moral vision to move us beyond ourselves to serve others. Hear this again. If anything characterizes our time in history, it is a loss of a sense of transcendence. We long for someone with a soaring moral vision to move us beyond ourselves to serve others. Presbyterian pastor John Ortberg wrote a book about cataloging the life of Jesus, and that book was entitled who is this man? And Ortberg wrote, We have all heard gifted orators who can entertain us for a moment through their skillful rhetoric. But they are playing a role. And they do not have lasting impact on us. For when they speak, we say, oh, how well he speaks. Then there are others who inspire us and change our lives. It all has to do with authenticity, Ortberg says, because we are hungry for somebody who's authentic. You've no doubt heard the saying, when you come to the gates of heaven, St. Peter is not going to say, why weren't you, Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Why weren't you, Mother Teresa? Why weren't you, Martin Luther King Jr.? St. Peter instead is going to say, why weren't you, you? So people who change the world tend to be authentic. They know who they are. And they also have integrity because of authenticity. Because someone who has integrity is clear on who they are, and they are that person consistently. And someone who has authenticity and integrity has a secure sense of self. And if you have a secure sense of self, you can be generous to other people because it is fear that makes us put ourselves first and build ourselves up. It's security that allows us to give to others. The second one, second attribute characteristic that I think of when I think of people who give, who are, give themselves away is humility. There are some people who don't like the attribute of humility. In fact, they resist it because they think humility implies self-deprecation. And nothing could be further from the truth because someone, if you ask me the single characteristic that Jesus had that attracted me to him, it would be his humility. He never attributed anything to himself. He always attributed it to God. He always deflected praise on himself. You see, per, a person who is humble is a person who has 
very deep, secure sense of who they are. I've often heard it described this way. Someone who has humility does not think less of himself. Someone who has humility thinks of himself less. Or to put it this way, somebody who doesn't have humility might say, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. You know, when I think of humility, I think of a phrase that is often attributed to President Harry Truman, who said, it is amazing to imagine what could happen in the world for good if nobody cared who got the credit. And you see, the cousin to humility is gratitude. Someone who is humble understands, instinctively understands, that not a single person walking the face of the earth can claim to have pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. We all stand on the shoulders of other people, every single one of us. And a dramatic retelling of that is Hebrews chapter 11. I love Hebrews chapter 11. I implore you to go home and read Hebrews chapter 11 today because it is, and essentially it is the narrative of the Hebrew people in one chapter. It begins with Cain and it begins with Noah and goes on through Abraham and Moses and it categorizes throughout Chapter 11, it categorizes the heroes of our Bible. And then the writer concludes with this. He's running out of time, so the writer says, And what more can I say? For time will fail me to tell you of Gideon, or Barak, or Samson, or Jephthah, or David, or Samuel, and the prophets. He's run out of time. He's been preaching for a whole chapter. He's run out of time. He knows he cannot give you a, an exhaustive listing of leaders because new leaders are always being brought up. And he closes with two of the most amazing verses in all of Holy Scripture to me. He closes with these. Yet all of these, after telling you about the heroes of the Bible, yet all of these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. That's astonishing to me. Think about that. It tells me that no matter how great the heroes of Judaism, Abraham and Moses and David, no matter how great the heroes of apostolic Christianity, Peter and Paul, no matter how great these people are, they did not receive what was promised because God had something more perfect in mind and that without us, they would not be made perfect. Think about that for a minute. Without you, completing the story, carrying the story on, what Peter did and what Paul did and what Moses did and what Abraham did, it's like passing the baton. Without us, the letter of the Hebrews says, they would not be made perfect. That's pretty amazing. The story of our faith depends on us carrying it forward and handing it on to the next generation. Someone once said, God does not have grandchildren. We have to pass it on to that generation. And finally, I think people who put themselves second have another attribute, and that is imagination. Einstein reportedly said, imagination is far more important than knowledge. 
Because, Einstein said, knowledge is limited, but imagination encircles the world. Our default position is the familiar. That which we know, that which we have experienced before. To be comfortable, our default position is to stay with the familiar. But history tells us that what lies just beyond the expanse of the horizon that we can see are great things. Great things that can change the world. Imagine the world without electricity. Imagine the world without communication from the telephone to the telegraph to the internet to Instagram. Imagine, imagine the world without automobile travel or air travel. Of course, that's a little dubious right now, air travel, but imagine that. You know, there are people who couldn't, they couldn't imagine that. Their imagination would not allow them to stop at what was known, what was familiar. People like Alexander Graham Bell, people like Thomas Edison, people like Henry Ford, people like the Wright brothers, they said, no, we want to fly in space. We want to travel across the earth in motorized vehicles. We want electricity. We want communication. We want telephones. And so they pushed the, the known horizons back and unveiled a whole new world for us. And that imagination hadn't stopped. Things are going to happen in the next year, two, three, four, that we can't imagine today because the pace of change is so incredibly fast. But if it's up to me, things are going to stay like they are because my default is the familiar. I'm not a genius. I'm not imaginative. But many are. But I want to retreat for a moment because you don't have to be Alexander Graham Bell. You don't have to be Thomas Edison. You don't have to be the Wright brothers. You don't have to be Henry Ford. You don't have to be whomever. You will change the world. You will change the world where you are. Every time you put others before yourself. I absolutely insist that small, selfless acts have cumulative effects. They are world-changing. Think about a simple act that our Lord Jesus Christ did at the end of his life. It's something that we do in Christian congregations weekly, some, has to do with the service of Holy Communion. But what did Jesus do at the end of his life? He got up from the table, John's Gospel says. He got up from the table. He took off his outer robe. He tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He said to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you would wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing now, but later you will understand. What more mundane task of giving oneself away for others, could there be 
than having your best friends come in who have been walking on dusty and dung-filled streets and washing their feet. Jesus modeled that for us. So let's go out and do others and do likewise and change the world. Amen.